I think all of us as business owners desire to have an exceptional customer experience for our customers. And we all strive for that, but very few achieve it, obviously, because it, by definition, it's exceptional. So therefore, probably an outlier. But I think that we miss the mark and we live below our potential of customer service a lot of the times in the interest of processes, efficiencies, and the way it's usually done. So I want to shatter a few myths here about how to create an exceptional customer experience. But I also want to make it clear that you don't have to sacrifice, you know, all of your processes and all of your standardization and structure and scalability in the name of customer service. So that we do this dance where we say everything need, either needs to be automated and efficient and driven by systems, but then you kind of lose a little bit of that touch. You lose a little bit of that humanity. You lose the, the customer service special feeling of customization and feeling like they are unique. And it becomes challenging. And on the flip side, you may have a really high touch service that's really customized, but then that becomes unscalable. So how do we dance in between these two things? How do we balance it out in the middle? And I'm going to share some tips with you that I think will reframe how you can implement a better customer service experience without sacrificing that scalability. So let's dive into that. First of all, I believe, and I'm going to assume that we're talking about a service-based business, but we can talk about products as well. This applies to both. But the universal example is typically a service because of the ability to have customer service, customer experiences, and to create more flexibility with the customer experience with services and to be able to adapt to them. So I'm going to use that as an example, but you can absolutely apply this to products. So let's talk about the first thing that I always recommend, which is ask yourself when you sign on a client, ask yourself how you can get them a quick win. And by a quick win, I mean instant gratification or a short-term minor success. So what is the first milestone? What is the first thing that they're going to be able to accomplish with you? As opposed to maybe investing a lot of time into a bigger result, what can you do that will make them so happy they hired you as fast as possible? And I don't mean cutting corners. I don't mean cheating your way to this. I'm figuring out, okay, what is the quickest win we can get? And I'll use our example. So most often when someone comes in for a CFO service, there's typically one thing that's like really itching, like really annoying them. And in some cases it might be a tax issue, depending on the time of year we're in, it could be a tax issue. It could be cash flow crunches. We might identify that there's like one particular priority that they want to focus on. And so what we will do, which sounds so silly, is that we will almost make onboarding a side project in some cases, and we will dive headfirst into one particular issue. So we will spend a couple of weeks. In this case, I have a client that I'm onboarding right now that we are focused on getting their S-Corp set up with a retroactive election to 2023, January 1. And but what I mean by that is we are trying to set them up for their S-Corp so that they can use the S-Corp for all of 2023. So to do that, we need to do that first. That is a top priority, but it will save them between 20 and 30 grand in taxes. So we're like, yeah, F onboarding. Let's get this done first for them. And we can get this done in a week. Given the right resources, we could get this done in a week, maybe two weeks. So the key here is what is the quick win? What is the quick little punch that you can get for them that makes them go, oh my God, I'm so happy that I hired you guys. And I understand that transformation takes a while. A lot of things take a while. But identify an element of what you do, whether it's, you know, producing something in a quick deliverable for them or summarizing what you've learned about them, giving them a deliverable that is tangible, but also valuable. Don't do it for the sake of doing it. But how can you deliver them a quick win of value in a short period of time and basically have them so grateful they hired you and build that momentum? So number one is quick wins. Number two is you have to listen and anticipate the problems and inconveniences your customer will face. So let's talk about like hospitality type services, things like that too. I always think of exceptional customer service. I go to like Ritz Carlton. I go to certain restaurants. I go to certain service-based businesses because that's the most memorable for me as a customer. And I think about what are the anticipated problems or inconveniences that they will experience. Uh, I'm going to use the most 
like obvious and this is not exceptional at this point, but it just came to me, which is when you're eating at dinner and they bring over like the warm wet towel to wipe your hands off with. I always go, Oh, that's nice. You know, I always think about that and say, Oh, that's a nice touch. I know a lot of restaurants do that now, but what you have to keep in mind is like, what are the ways that you could enter, you could insert into your process, something that will make them go, Oh, that's a nice touch. You know, and this kind of goes along with, I have another one with attention to detail after this, but I think attention to detail and anticipating problems and inconveniences is key because you don't know, like your solutions create other problems, if you will. Let's look at this example. Let's say you are running an Airbnb in, in a nice destination and you realize that your Airbnb is kind of elevated on a mountaintop. You've got great views, right? But it's a good solid like mile and a half down the mountain to get to the grocery store. So could you in your service offer like a daily delivery of groceries from the store? Like one of your concierges will, will drive down there, pick up what you need and drive it up to the house. Or could you offer some type of service where they will, where you'll take them down or drive them around a little bit that you get, you know, X number of hours of a van for a day when you're staying in this house. What I'm saying is that they're anticipating that, okay, we have this core offer, which is to use the home, but it creates a problem in that the person will have to rent a car or they will have to, you know, find a means of transportation to get anything. They will also have to grocery shop, you know, and it won't be walkable and they'll have to be able to bring stuff home. So how could we eliminate that problem for them? And then you will become the preferred provider because you just made it so convenient. And we have to start anticipating what are the problems that the, that our customer will have and how can we get around it, get ahead of it and address it head on. So anticipating problems and knowing that there will be a, you know, a challenge in their way and how do you clear as many challenges out of the way as possible? So kind of that, I've mentioned this on one of our previous episodes about the what could go wrongs that I used to do in auditing days. And we would have these things called what could go wrong. We, were, we would have to think of everything that could get in the way of success. Everything that could get in the way of success for our clients in terms of their transactions. But I want you to think about this for your clients in terms of their experience. Like what could get in the way? What could go sour? What could go sideways or wrong? How do you account for that? And how do you get over that as a business? Now, the next couple that I'm going to go through are specifically going to be challenged for how impractical they may be. So I'm going to I'm going to dive into these, but I want to address the thing I mentioned at the front of the episode which is that these things are not designed to be scalable. It's not designed to be scalable. It, it's designed to be memorable. And I think memorable precedes scalable because you're never going to be at the point where you need to scale until you can create something memorable and and be able to grow it. So I think instead of focusing on scaling, this is my biggest message to you entrepreneurs, is to instead of focus on scaling so much or using the word scaling to describe what you're doing, focus on growing your presence, growing your brand, growing your message, growing your customer base, whatever it may be, growing your bottom line, and then worry about scaling it. Now you do want to be building processes, yes, but I think that there's a way to create a scalable version of what you're doing and be able to deliver on it. So the next couple that I want to go through are do the unexpected. And my favorite piece of advice, which I have to shout out to Nick Harder for giving me, Nick gave me this advice three years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. Everything I do, I think of this. And it's do what isn't scalable until it isn't scalable. I love that. And this is something that counters a lot of what entrepreneurs are told. And they say, do the things that are scalable. Yes, but not too soon. Because while it's just you, this is your opportunity to build a relationship, to build a brand, to be one-on-one, -on -one, to be in the thick of it with your customer and to listen. And if you are already outsourcing some of these functions, if you're already trying to create processes around this where you can step away, then you're going to be missing out on a lot of the things that you need to be hearing, in my opinion. So doing what isn't scalable until it isn't scalable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one thing that I do or multiple things that I do where this applies. Number one, if you're texting me right now, and my link is going to be in the show notes. If you're texting me, my number is 
609-637-6374. And you can text me anything really. But if you text me the word daily, I'm sending out daily mindset tips and business strategy tips to get help get you into a CEO mindset. We're calling it the daily CFO. And you just text me the word daily and you'll be getting it. But or weekly, if you want to just come on Mondays and, and get these tips with the rest of us. But we'll be texting you. And if you text me, I will text you back. It is me. It is not my team. It is not a robot. It is nothing. And it will never be those things. It will never be a robot. It will never be a robot texting you back. I promise you. If I get to the point where I need a robot to text you back, I'm not texting. Okay? Like, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that you're texting Shannon, not that you're texting a robot. If you want to text a robot, I'll get a chat bot or something. But the whole point of it is to create a connection. And if you're outsourcing connection, what the hell are you doing? You're not connecting. That's my opinion. So I think creating an optimal and, and ideal customer service experience means sometimes it means you got to show up. You got to be the one to connect. You got to be the one to deliver. You got to be the one on the front lines actually texting the customers. and. While I don't advocate for that all the time, it's, it's so counterintuitive because I always tell my clients, like, you shouldn't be responding to every customer inquiry. I think there's a balance. I think that there's a bit of like a filtration that can happen with customer inquiries, customer service requests, and so on that you're not expected to answer as the founder. But I think that when there's an opportunity to make an impression, when there's an opportunity to ask a question, to get insights, to connect with people and build a relationship, especially strategic ones, you got to show up at the table. You have to start showing up. You can't be outsourcing every piece of communication, especially with your clients and customers, because they're the most important. And I, I have this philosophy that if you have too many customers to be able to talk to them, then you probably have too many customers, or then you should that then you are an owner and not an operator, and there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people want to be business owners and not operate the business or not have the have them be the face of the business. But what I'm talking about is if you're trying to build a business online based on relationships, based on connection, and based on building a personal brand, you can't be outsourcing that stuff because that's part of the personal brand. But I also think that building a personal brand is going to be key going into this next era of entrepreneurship. And I think that, you know, it depends on what your goals are. But I truly believe in doing what's not scalable until it isn't scalable and to do the unexpected for customers. So when you go above and beyond for a customer, they will remember that. I'm not saying make it a habit and part of your process, but I think that if you can allow yourself to go above and beyond, it will make a huge difference. Now, here's an example of it. I think it was Ritz Carlton. I think it was. I'm going off of my memory here. But they have, I think it was them, that they give their staff a budget to wow the customer. So let's say I don't, I'm making this up completely, but let's say you find out that the customer loves a certain type of wine. Maybe they buy a bottle and they put it in the room and it's kind of like, Oh my God, how do they know? Or they call, like they find out the customer, they find out something about the customer and then they can call, you know, their friend or a place that they go or a place in their city or something like first of all, kind of creepy. Number number two, it's really interesting how much we can stalk each other now. Like if you go on my Instagram or you check my stories, you might know like, okay, I know what kind of wine Shannon likes. I know she ha loves dogs. I know this and this about her. And you may know enough about me to know what you could possibly get me as a gift. And actually Courtney, my COO, she does this. She looks up our clients and she's like, hmm, this person seems to like this, I think I'm going to get them this as a welcome gift. And, you know, she does a little bit of stocking, which is super fun. And although for some, especially past generations, this might be invasive or weird, I feel like we have this data available to us. And this is a really big opportunity to wow people if you can customize the experience to the extent possible. And I think it also always starts with asking the right questions, gathering the right data and being able to use that effectively. So I want to touch on something I brought up earlier, which is, Shannon, you just said do what's not scalable. But how do I make that a process? Like, how do I turn what's not scalable into part of my process? So here's the integration. 
I'll use I'll use us as an example with my texting. So I write and send out all the text messages. I do. I will I will respond to you if you text me, but here's how I've systematized it. In our SOP, we are putting in there that this is when Shannon writes the messages. This is how they go out. And then Shannon will check her community text message will say once a day. And, you know, I'll respond with voice notes. Like that's the process. So it's a question of, okay, that will take on average 15 minutes a day, maybe, depending on what I get back. It's really not that big a deal. 15 minutes a day is nothing for me to be able to respond to stuff or, you know, it's the time. I'm not doing it at the same time, by the way, but it's the time of a bathroom break. <laughs> like if you took a 10 to 15 minute bathroom break during the day and you go instead of that, by all means, use the bathroom. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying if you took the same amount of time and you added one mental slot into your day for an extra bathroom break, that's all the time you're adding. So I, I want you to understand the minutia and how low of a time commitment this is to do something like that. And the point being, you can do what's not scalable. And if it does become hours and hours a day, now you have another system at play. Like now you probably have an offer. Now you probably have something that you can grow into. If y'all start texting me every single day and it becomes unbearable where I'm spending two hours a day responding to text messages, well, guess what? That's now going to be a paid service. <laughs> so that's exactly Nick's advice was do, not, do what's not scalable until it's not scalable. And this scenario is a perfect example because that would be the point at which it's not scalable because now I will have to create a paid offer. Now I'll have to allocate time. Now my team will have to support me in it, but that would be the indicator. It's not scalable anymore. So until you hit that point, I think you, I want you to stop planning ahead for what's going to go wrong. If you continue to do this and you try to wow your customer. And I want you to instead think of how can I wow my customer to the point where I literally can't anymore. Like, what will that point look like? How do I support them until then? And what is the positive impact I want to have happen? What does success look like if I do this? Because I think if you can plan it out right and you set the intention, it can be very successful. So I would say chase an exceptional customer experience. By all means, do not people please. Do not scope creep your way out of this. Do not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying create and wow your customer experience to the nth degree. So you're creating something memorable that is worth telling people about.